our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. My goal in this deposition was to be truthful, but not particularly helpful. Welcome to Unspun, the podcast that makes you better at finding the truth. The way people get news is changing. It used to be that there were many reporters who would research stories and write articles, but now politicians and famous people share information directly with you on social media and the internet. That means you find out things fast, but it's up to you to make sure the information's actually accurate. And newsmakers don't always do their part. The temptation to manipulate information is strong. They bend the truth to deceive so that they can avoid accountability, so that they can advance their agendas. When you recognize these agendas, you can sometimes find out what's real. And we're at a crossroads where anyone can share anything online. So it's important to sharpen your critical thinking skills. Finding that deception before it goes viral is pretty much a survival skill now. And we're gonna do it together. Let's get unspun. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unspun. Today's episode is about fear. Six, eight, nine, nine. Six, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. I am a little sorry that podcasts don't have video for this one. This is the audio from a campaign ad that Democrat Lyndon Johnson ran. So here's a description of what the visual would show. It starts with a little blonde girl who's picking petals from a daisy and she's counting them. And when she hits nine, the camera starts to zoom in on her eye. And that zoom concentrates on that girl's right eye until her pupil fills the screen, which is then replaced by the flash and sound of a nuclear explosion. A voiceover by Johnson menacingly says, these are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. The stakes, of course, in the election, where he wants people to elect Lyndon Johnson. The statement made in this ad is an appeal to fear, and it's very common. An appeal to fear is a logical fallacy where someone tries to scare you into agreeing with them without using facts or evidence that the threat is real. For example, a car salesman might say, if you don't buy this car today, I can't guarantee it will still be available tomorrow. They're trying to create an unreasonable fear of missing out on the car deal without proof that the car will actually sell that quickly. Or imagine a high school student named Alex who is a member of the school newspaper. Alex is working on an article about the school's principal, Mr. Jones, and he's discovered that Mr. Jones has been embezzling money. Alex might be afraid to publish the article because he knows that Mr. Jones is a powerful man, But Alex also believes it's important for the students to know the truth. Mr. Jones finds out about Alex's article and confronts him, and he threatens Alex with suspension or expulsion if he publishes. Mr. Jones's threat is a clear example of an appeal to fear. He's trying to silence Alex by threatening him with negative consequences. And Alex is in a difficult position, but he must decide whether to stand up for what he believes in or to back down in the face of those threats. And here's the really crazy thing. Often, the threatened punishment never even happens. That car will probably be there tomorrow. Mr. Jones would get in a lot more trouble if he expelled Alex, so it's unlikely he will. If you don't vote for Johnson, it's probably not going to blow up the world. These threats are just a scare tactic with no teeth. It happens in elections a lot, too. So let's see if we can find some appeals to fear in this week's warm-up. I have joined the political arena so that the powerful can no longer beat up on people who cannot defend themselves. Nobody knows the system better than me. Which is why I alone can fix it. This was former President Trump back before he was president, his nomination acceptance speech at the 2016 Republican convention. The clip you heard was preceded and followed by a litany that he said were wrong with America, with a lot of focus on crime and immigration. I alone can fix it? That's an appeal to fear. If you don't elect me, all of this crime and all of these problems are just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. Let's do one more example. The people in power use their police agencies to arrest their opponents for made-up crimes in an attempt to discredit them, bankrupt them, imprison them, 
exile them, are all of the above. And if you're not paying attention, you may not realize that Joe Biden is using exactly those tactics to make sure that Donald Trump is not his opponent in 2024. Here's the problem. If these tactics end up working to keep Trump from winning or even running in 2024, it is going to be the last American election that will be decided by ballots rather than bullets. So here, former governor and presidential candidate Mike Huckabee is using an appeal to fear to talk about prosecuting Trump. He threatens that if Trump isn't elected, we won't have a democratic process anymore because the people who agree with Trump will just take what they want by force. Another appeal to fear. And while bad outcomes are bad, that doesn't make caution the best criteria for deciding what to do. So the next time a newsmaker tries to scare or intimidate you instead of having a thoughtful discussion, remember, that's just the appeal to fear fallacy at work. And identifying those logical fallacies can help us stand up to bullying, to think for ourselves, and ultimately to make better decisions. When we fall for an appeal to fear, it can help us make poor choices, to give up our freedoms, or to silence dissenting voices, all to avoid some imaginary punishment. It undermines critical thinking and meaningful debate. So, you can always think about whose interests the speaker has at heart. Are they yours, or are they their own? After the break, we'll learn about how fear can actually affect how you see and understand the news with our guest. I'll be right back. Welcome back. And my guest this week is Dr. Seth Norholm, and he is a professor of neuroscience at Wayne State University. And um, I would love to see if you could tell me a little bit more about your background. Yeah, I'm Seth Norholm, and I'm an associate professor of psychiatry here at Wayne State. And uh, I'm a translational neuroscientist by training. So I started uh, my career looking at uh, models of early life stress and extreme stress and over the course of my career, um, really changed into looking at uh, the human clinical experience. So started doing work in fear and anxiety, specifically in um, populations that are frequently traumatized. So first responders, military service members, um, individuals who live in, in high risk areas like the inner city. Um, and so in the, about 2013, I decided to become more involved clinically and, and went through what's called re-specialization of my PhD. So I did more training in clinical psychology to augment what I had done previously in neuroscience. And so I spent the last few years really focused on exposure therapy, which we use for anxiety disorders and PTSD. And that is, you know, in short, looking at how you can present um, triggering stimuli, whether they trigger fear through a phobia or they trigger fear through PTSD. You know, learning to experience those stimuli in real life again and to suppress your fear to those stimuli. And so we, we do this through exposure therapy and we do it through a number of different modalities. You know, sometimes it's narratives. So you'll come in and, and really discuss with a therapist and go through the traumatic event over and over in detail. So you become less and less distressed while speaking about it. And more recently, we've been using virtual reality as a way to augment people's memories by presenting virtual representations of their trauma situation, be it a civilian trauma like a motor vehicle accident or an assault uh, or a combat trauma like PTSD, you know, something that occurred while you were deployed, like being exposed to small arms fire and IED explosion and things like that. Um, and that's all based on the process called fear extinction. And that's a learning process that occurs when you disassociate a stimulus or a time or a place uh, with an adverse outcome. So the you know, hallmark example is the service member who experienced an IED explosion while deployed to the Middle East. And now when they come back stateside, you know, when they get inside a vehicle or they're sitting in traffic, they have significant fear and anxiety symptoms. And so through exposure therapy and extinction learning, you dissociate any vehicle or disassociate any vehicle with an aversive outcome. So I've been doing that for the last several years from a, a translational perspective. So what we can learn from animal models in terms of the human condition and what we can learn clinically that we potentially want to look at in terms of mechanisms. Wow, that's all super interesting. What does what you do teach us about how we interact with information? 
Yeah, so what we look at in the laboratory, which extends to the real life experience, is how you perceive your environment, how you make an assessment of the different situations and stimuli that you're exposed to. And that really harkens back to uh, some really primitive circuitry in the brain, which is the circuitry that's involved in, in threat detection. So, you know, for example, the hallmark would be, you know, if you, if you and I got onto a plane and when the plane takes off and there's loud noises and there's clickings and you're, you know, 10, 15, 30,000 feet above the ground, you know, that's going to be anxiety provoking for most people. But, and what will happen is your, your autonomic nervous system, which responds to things very quickly in terms of ensuring your survival in a potentially hazardous situation. So when the plane does take off and you hear some noises underneath and you're not sure what that is, you're going to have, you know, a, a rush of adrenaline. You're going to feel something in the pit of your stomach. Maybe your heart rate increases. And then based on your experience, so if you're a, you know, a frequent flyer, you recognize that these are the sounds that occur when you're on an airplane and that even though you're 30,000 feet above the ground, you know, you're, you're safe in that environment almost, you know, 100% of the time. Obviously, there are accidents that occur. But anyway, your, your higher processes kick in and you're allowed to reassess the situation and say, okay, my body signaled that I was in danger, but now I'm safe. And that's what we do in a lot of different situations is we're looking for perceived threats. And so that could be, you know, something acute like an illness, like we dealt with the pandemic in the past few, year, past few years, that could be something like an intruder in your home or on your property where that is a legitimate threat that you need to respond to. Or it might be something more abstract. And that's more of our, our human experience, which is what might happen to me? What can happen to me? What if this happens? And those what if questions also evoke a visceral physiological response that you need to cope with in some degree, whether you say, this is something that I can deal with when the time comes, or I should probably focus more on the report that I have due for work or school than thinking about these more abstract things. So when you're interacting with the world, you're doing an assessment, and that assessment comes down to what things might be rewarding, what things might be aversive, what things might be important socially in terms of, you know, this is a potential relationship, you know, this is a potential social network or friendship I can engage in. And so you're making these assessments and those assessments form the basis of learning, which is potentially changing your behavior based on new information. So if you realize that one situation is dangerous or one situation is very rewarding, like a job that you like that gives you personal satisfaction, financial reward, then you're going to engage in that, you know, more readily than something that might be aversive. So we learn to interact with our environment based on the feedback that we get from those different situations. Okay. Um, and so would the interacting in the environment include things like information that you get that's like mass mediated? Yes. And that's obviously something that's been more relevant in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, because the way we thought about this classically as psychologists was when you're talking about interactions, you know, for the most part, you were talking about face-to-face -face interactions, whether you're face-to-face -face with another person or face-to-face -face with a situation, you know, these were real life situations. And of course, you know, we had television and media in terms of that domain that was giving us information, for example, about conflicts in the world, natural disasters. And of course we had, you know, telecommunications in the form of our, you know, landline phones in our houses. So for the most part, you were talking about your practical experience, and then that was, you know, augmented by the media that you were exposed to. What's happened now, obviously, is we have these devices that fit in the palm of our hand that give us access to all kinds of information, be it, you know, information that's legitimate, like notifications about, um, you know, work, notifications about news. Uh, all the way to, you know, I want to learn more about a topic in my life. So I'll go ahead and do a Google search or jump on Wikipedia. And so what used to be relatively limited filtering, you know, you filtered what you watched on TV, which for a long time was limited in the number of channels you got as you went from antenna based TV to cable to satellite, you know, there was an exponent, exponential growth in the available media. 
but for the most part, you're able to filter that out by selecting what you're watching. And, and so what happens now with the smartphones is there's a fire hose of information available to us. And from a cognitive standpoint, we just don't have the capacity to filter it all out. And so, you know, we talked a second ago about interacting with the stimuli and the situations available to you, you know, that filtering out process in terms of what's dangerous, what's safe, what's important, what's not important becomes exponentially more difficult because of the volume of information available to us. Okay. So I have a follow-up question. Uh, in my field, back in the day, we used to have this theory, the mean world syndrome theory, right? And so what the mean world syndrome theory said was basically, if you got a lot of messages about bad things happening in your world, which typically is like what most TV news is because of the way news works, that kind of thing, that you would eventually decide that your real world situation was a lot more threatening to you. Um, do you think that those kind of fire hose of information that you talked about with social media maybe makes that worse? Yeah, and I would look at that a, a few different ways. One is you're right, you know, historically speaking, whatever the media platform was, you know, we know that two things will get headlines, you know, almost universally, which is fear and sex. And so when you were watching the, the, the nightly news or you were reading headlines in the paper, you know, they were often skewed negatively because that attracts more eyes. And now in this day and age, attracts more clicks and, and, and visits to sites and that sort of thing. And so there's been this negative bias for a while. And I think, you know, there is, it's a bit of a, a two-way street in terms of the fire hose that's available to us, because what that allows you to do is to find uh, an environment or, or a, a habitat virtually that uh, either reinforces beliefs you've already had uh, or potentially gives you information that might, you know, change your belief system. So in other words, you can find a silo or a camp that's going to fulfill what you've already uh, perceived. So the challenge for us in a nutshell is to objectively take in this information through the fire hose and be able to make an evidence-based decision on whether or not that's relevant to look at the sources, to look at the information, to look at other sources potentially and see if the information you're getting is actually backed up in a number of different areas. Um, so you can either find your lane within that fire hose and say, I'm going to watch right-wing media and that's going to, you know, reinforce what I already believe and skew you towards the negative, or I'm going to try and be more, you know, to use Fox News' old slogan, fair and balanced, and I'm going to get information from a number of different sources and try and compare it to one another to see which one holds more merit. Now, that being said, because everything is at our fingertips and we live in this world, you know, seconds at a time, a lot of people won't take the time to do an objective appraisal of what they're learning because they simply don't have the time, frankly, but also because it requires a lot of, you know, digging below the surface, below the headline, below the lead and into the actual meat of what you're reading. And because most of us, myself included, use things like uh, Twitter or X now, um, and really what you're exposed to is, you know, a short number of characters to fit in a small snippet of news. And then what will often happen is that small snippet is what gets shared widely and virally and the, the details and the evidence get left behind. So we have a phrase that we use called doom scrolling, right? The idea that you're like continually refreshing your feeds and those kind of things. Do you get kind of like a cyclical effect then, right? Like you doom scroll and it makes you upset. So you doom scroll more and you get more upset. Yeah. And I think, you know, most people who are active on social media will admit to doom scrolling. And, you know, a lot of the, the term doom scrolling comes from what they're scrolling through. So like you said, it's oftentimes negatively biased or it's um, fear evoking. Um, and there's, you know, oftentimes an imbalance between the doom and gloom uh, feed that you're reading and the positive stories, you know, what's happened that is good, what legislation was passed that could benefit people. Uh, so there's already an imbalance when you're scrolling. So I would argue that some people are doing the doom scrolling as a way of 
trying to find the positive amidst all that negative, you know, trying to find the story about accountability within this long stream of all of the corrupt and criminal things that we're seeing in, in politics and government and society. Okay, so I know that um, social media companies in particular have algorithms, right? And the algorithms are designed to keep you engaged so they can keep your eyeballs and make more money off of you. Do people have sort of their own way that they also kind of bias the information that they take in? Do they go looking for particular kinds of things? Yeah, and I think that, you know, goes along with this idea of, you know, confirmation bias is one thing that we talk about in psychology, which is you have this belief and you're seeking out support for your belief and filtering out something that might be contrary to what you think. So, for example, if you're a dyed-in-the-wool conservative and, you know, you've always looked at a limited role of government and people should, um, you know, succeed on their own merit and get things based on, you know, the, the old school Republican uh, talking points, then you're going to seek out venues and avenues where you can substantiate that line of thinking. Um, and then you could see, you know, and you see that on both sides of the spectrum in terms of what your belief system might be. So you're seeking out others who think like you. And what we're finding, I think, more recently is that, you know, in terms of percentages, you know, a small group of people in terms of the number, when looking at the entire population of 330 million, a small number who have these really extreme views, anti-government, um, you know, the, the MAGA contingent, to use a label, um, you can seek that out now that we have the access to the fire hose. So it was much harder back in the day. You know, you could be sort of a closeted anti-government fascist and not really have much of a platform. But now because of social media and because of the internet and everything that's available to us, you can find like-minded people. And as we just seen in the House of Representatives, a small group of people with a loud enough voice can make a difference. And I think that provides a lot of ammunition and motivation for people because they recognize that it's a different playing field. My voice was minimized in the past, but now it doesn't have to be. Okay. So I have a follow-up question on that then. So you talked about confirmation bias, right? And how people look for information that reinforces what they already believe. I've heard, and I'm, my field is not psychology, so uh, I'm not really qualified to judge this statement, that people actually have an easier time understanding or remembering information that fits with those kind of existing models of the world that they have. Is there evidence for that? And if so, how does that work? Yeah, you know, when we talk about learning and memory, you know, there are tried and true ways to facilitate one, one's memory and retention of information. And so, you know, the mnemonic devices that people typically use you know, to make a song or to make an acronym or something that'll help you remember. But if it's already consistent with your schema, which is your way of approaching life and, and your, your own self and your representation within society, your sense of self, in other words, uh, if that's already consistent, then yes, it's more readily retained because it's not, um, you know, sort of against the grain. It's not something you're trying to introduce or assimilate into your existing self schema. So, uh, I, yes, but I would also say that, you know, we are plastic individuals who are capable uh, of learning new information. And so it, yes, it takes a little more work if you're trying to retain information that does not fit into that schema, but it's not impossible. Is it fair to say that people are inclined to look more for threatening information than for non-threatening information? Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, that plays into what we were talking about at the beginning, which is, you know, your assessment of threat. Um, you know, for the most part, people are going to attune to threatening or potentially threatening situations uh, more so than, than potentially rewarding. And it gets back to, um, you know, this, the survivalist instinct that we have. So if you think about it, you know, evolutionarily or in terms of how the nervous system is structured, you know, it's skewed towards, 
you know, eliminating threats and then things like, you know, appetite and, and, you know, finding food and pleasure. So I think we're inherently biased to look for the threatening things first and then, you know, look for the, the, the positive life sustaining elements in our, our situations. Okay. So if I had uh, maybe malicious intent, I would maybe want to structure my messages to feel more threatening or make things feel more urgent than they are. Yeah. And, and that's what we've seen in the popular media is here's how your life situation, here's how your family, here's how your livelihood is being threatened by these others. And that is a much stronger and more compelling argument than, hey, why don't you come join our side? Look at all the benefits we can provide for you. We can give you health care. We can give you shelter. You know, those things all sound great, but eliminating a potential threat like this person's coming to take your job, coming to take your house, coming to, you know, assault your family. You're going to pay attention to that because it's, you know, threatening. It's not, you know, so when you're looking at that scale between positives and negatives, yeah, you're going to skew towards the negative. And, 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 and people know that because they know that, that that is human nature. And so that we talked about that being sort of the message in the media in terms of what the headline reads. And, you know, here, you know, if you even if you scroll through something like CNN, you get past the headlines of the day and you start to look at, you know, what's down below. Oftentimes it's like, here's the thing that you're eating that could kill you or your doctor says you should never do this. And yes, it's clickbait, but they're also playing on the sense of you need to be thinking about ways that you can be harmed or potentially killed. All right. Um, so I'm looking for the good news in this. So are there things people could do to kind of get around these tendencies that they have? I know you mentioned like taking the time to go beyond like the headline or go beyond the tweet kind of thing. Are there things people should be doing as far as like their habits with their phones, for example, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, and that that's the, the good news to take from this is you can shut off the fire hose. You know, you can um, limit or eliminate how much you're taking in from, you know, other than checking the headlines of the day to see what might be of interest to you, like a wildfire, like Canadian smoke coming down towards, you know, your state. The things that you need to be acutely aware of, you know, that's important to scroll through. But if you find yourself spending more than five or 10 minutes on your phone, really digging deep into some of these things, that is something to be aware of and to, to limit. So the other thing you can do is, you know, engage yourself in your daily life. What do you need to do at home in terms of, you know, chores, parenting, you know, taking care of your pets, hobbies that you might like that are not smartphone based. So the idea is not to stick your head in the sand and pretend that all this negative stuff doesn't exist, but to strike the right balance between what is immediately in front of you that needs to be taken care of or that you can do versus what is this other stuff that's out here. Um, so yes, you can have your own agency and locus of control and say, I'm just not gonna engage in all of this stuff. I wanna be aware of the things that I need to protect myself and my family, but I'm not going to engage in this, you know, this more larger philosophical discussions and these larger, uh, you know, worldview types of issues. The only caveat I would say to that is there was a time when you could kind of write off politics. You know, politics, politicians are going to lie. It doesn't matter who's in office. You know, they're not going to really make that much of an impact on my life. You know, maybe taxes get higher, then they get lower. Maybe prices go up and then they come down. But I'm not going to engage in that political sphere. I'm going to focus on my own life. What I think has shifted in the last few years is a lot of what's happening in the political realm is having real world impacts. It's stripping women of rights. It's not protecting the earth against global warming, which is going to potentially affect generations. So I would argue, again, to strike that balance between what do you need to do in your life for your own personal happiness and well-being and that of your family while keeping track of what is potentially threatening without looking for the potential threats. Okay. So maybe the slow news movement has something going for it there then. 
you know, just the idea that you'd want to look for more long form things and those kind of things and pick that for your information environment. All right, another question for you. Um, I know that you, um, for a professor, are pretty visible uh, with some writing that you do for columns and through your social media account, which I'll put some links in the show notes for those kind of things. What made you decide to try to communicate with a general audience in this way? Yeah, I'm glad you asked, because for me, um, you know, it really was sort of a, a process and it started, you know, in, in 2015. So as we've talked about, you know, my area has been fear and anxiety and it's been fear and anxiety in terms of the individual. So what kinds of things do you need to deal with in your own life that are, you're struggling with? but also fear and anxiety at the societal level, at the community level. And so much like what we've been talking about today, in 2015, there was an uptick in misinformation that coincided with the upcoming 2016 presidential election. And so you were hearing things like there's a group of migrants that are coming towards the southern border that are a threat to us. We need to watch out for Syrians and other people from the Middle East who are living among us in the States and want to do us harm. And so you saw these statements being thrown out there that really had no merit or very little merit. And for me, it became a switch when I started seeing more and more of that in the popular media. And I was saying, these are lies. This is misinformation. You know, this can't stand. And I know that I'm one person with one voice, but for me, it was this has to be called out. And so I wrote an article for anxiety.org, which is a group that I work with that is specifically a public resource for dealing with anxiety um, in your daily life. And this piece was, you know, dealing with fear and anxiety in the digital world, because as we've been talking about, there was so much information being put out there that wasn't being properly vetted. It was being thrown out there because it had shock jock appeal. It made that candidate get more camera time. It made that candidate rally whatever base felt like they were threatened. And so that was really the impetus in me getting more vocal was to say, here's how we need to think about these things. Just don't listen to these things at face value. And as you know, if you followed politics for the last eight years now, that misinformation and those lies have just mushroomed and it's just out of control. And so it really became, as we were talking about in the last question, an issue of is this noise and is this rhetoric that typically comes with the election season, you know, candidates attacking one another, making inflammatory statements to get, you know, visibility, is this going to have a larger impact? And as we saw, it certainly did. You know, let's just take the pandemic as, as an example. You know, we saw lies and misinformation in the face of this global crisis that was having a direct impact on people. People were getting sick, people were dying, and it wasn't getting any better. So for me, it was really addressing these sources of fear and anxiety that were community and media based, you know, on top of what you would typically think of as certain of fear and anxiety, like, you know, I, I don't like heights or closed spaces or spiders, this is a much bigger issue. And I felt like, you know, there needed to be a louder voice calling this out. Um, and I think, you know, it, it has, you know, grown over the last eight years and that there are other voices speaking out about the lies and misinformation. Um, but I do want to make the point that for me, it was never political. It was always about what was being relayed in the public and how that could be perceived and how dangerous that could be. And uh, what kind of response have you gotten kind of from the public that you communicate with now? You know, for the most part, it's positive. You know, people are I'm glad people are speaking out about this. You know, I was happy to read this and see this in places like The New York Times, New York Post, MSNBC. But you can imagine, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, with this smaller group that is extremely radicalized and, you know, has taken this to a, a dangerous and weaponized degree, I've certainly gotten those responses as well. But as I've been uh, suggesting throughout this interview, you know, I'm able to filter that out and look at, you know, and we can argue whether or not that it's healthy to do, but to look at the content of what people are writing and say, okay, this is just more rhetoric and noise versus this person has a point. Okay, fair enough. I am going to thank you very much for uh, visiting with us on Unspun this week. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. 
Thanks for getting Unspun with me this week. Unspun is a production of me, Amanda Sturgill, and is a proud member of the MSW Media family of podcasts. Send me your thoughts and ideas about trickery in the news on Gmail at theunspunpodcast at gmail.com. I even write back. And find this episode's show notes and more information at theunspunpodcast.substack.com. Want to learn more and get smarter? Check out my book, Detecting Deception, Tools to Fight Fake News, which is available on Amazon or your favorite online bookseller. And until next time, stay sharp, everyone. <laughs>